Okay, so uh, what we're going to do here is I'm going to go real quickly through some history of circus training, um, which you can see the first picture of here, uh, a steam locomotive. I'm not sure the era, but uh, we've got a whole load of circus wagons on those flat cars back there. Um, and we're going to go through these, and Kelly will jump in if he wants to add comment on any of these, but then we'll get to the bulk of it, which is more current, at least in the sense of, of Kelly's tenure on the train, and, and talk a lot about that. So I'd say that Looking at that picture right there, I, I'd say it's probably early 1900s because of those, uh, those telephone poles. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> and there's just another fun shot that I caught somewhere. Um, obviously, older as well, you notice that the boxcar is, is wooden. Um, and, and actually, in, in a little bit of clown history, this is Lou Jacobs, who, who very, very famous Ringling Brothers clown, actually very famous circus clown in general. Um, he was, I mean, a master clown, and the things that he did and the things that he taught um, were passed on through generations, and, and he taught at Clown College when Ringling Brothers Clown College was around. He taught there and, and taught the old style of circus clowning, but... A, I mean, a true legend in all senses of the word, and, uh, and and so of course you see the picture here. He was in a lot of publicity pictures, especially during his era, because he really truly was the face of clowning for Ringling Brothers for all those years. It, it was really it was Lou and Emmett Kelly that uh, that really epitomized uh, circus clowning in the in the broader sense of. Uh, of the community. I mean, you had uh, Felix Adler and you had uh, Mark Anthony and and uh, those clowns that were circus clowns that people knew, but in the broader sense of just people who maybe didn't know circus per se would recognize Lou in, uh, and and uh, their faces because um, they were so iconic. Uh, cool. And his shoes were really not that big. I mean, the <laughs> shoes were closer than his head, so... <laughs> And, and here's another uh, older shot, again, of uh, more wooden cars, so it dates it of the uh, elephants who, who you will see later were still riding the train up until the end. And, and you can see behind all the people, too, they're looking at the elephants, but behind them, all those poles right there, those are actually for the tent because Ringling Brothers used to perform in the tent. And so when it was in a tent, those were the, the tent poles and everything that would, that would hold the, the tent in place, the main post. Um, and again, everything traveled on the train for the most part. There were a few things that maybe went overland, but for the most part, everything went on to the train, performers, animals, uh, all the props, all the wagons that housed all the things that made up the greatest show on earth. And they would travel from town to town on the rails, and when they'd show up, they'd unload the animals like this and have a big ballyhoo parade down the main street of the town, pretty much promoting that the circus was in town. It's here. The show's arrived. Come watch the show. Come see the circus. What better way to tell people the circus is here than to have 20-some elephants walking down the road? Come on. <laughs> Speaking of elephants, there's another shot. Of <laughs> there they are again. Showing them off, I suppose. Um, and some of the well, circus training. Probably back. when they unloaded them again, because what they would do is they would unload them in the train yards. They would find a location that was closest to the arena or in those days where the tent was going to be set up. Um, the closest location would be where they would unload the elephants and the animals, and then they would unload them in the train yard and then walk them from that place to the actual venue itself. So they have them all lined up, they're ready to go, and then uh, there's actually spectators that are there to see them because, again, it, it's just one of those things. You don't see it every day, and so when the circus comes to town, you come out. It's a, it's a family holiday. You come out and you, you watch the circus come to town. <laughs> um, this slide I threw in just to make people aware that there was more than one uh, circus organization um, back in the day. There were quite a few of them, actually. They kind of eventually all merged up into the one or two that were left at the end. Um, but there's one on the lower left, Cole Brothers Circus. We, I think we'll hear that word or name again. Spark Circus in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, so there's a lot of... Uh, Ringling Brothers Barn... They weren't the only circuses in town. Or no, they, the they were the granddaddy, but um, <clears throat> I mean, and still to this day, even though Ringling Brothers closed down a few years back, there's still shows that are going around. Like yeah, Cole, uh, you got Cole Brothers, you got Clyde Beatty, you have Circus Vargas, you have um, Circus Vasquez. There's a lot of shows that are that are still out there going around. And uh, the interesting thing, actually, with some of the older shows, you had Hagenback and Wallace. Um, which was one of the shows back in the old days. Well, when they closed down, 
Ringling Brothers actually acquired them and turned them into their prop shop. So for Ringling Brothers, for Feld Entertainment, when they were creating the new shows, the the department that was creating the new props and the floats and, and all those things was Hagen Back and Wallace, which was an old circus show. So even though the shows may have closed down, the the name and legacy still carried on. Um, and that was one of the ways that Ringling Brothers truly honored them. Um, you also had Sells Floto, which was the concessionaires on the concourse selling the programs and knickknacks. Sells Floto was also another circus that um, was around during the heyday. And then, like, like I said, when they closed down, um, they they transformed into the uh, the concessions for Ringling Brothers. <laughs> this looks like the uh, maybe the Barnum Barnum uh, headquarters CEO type car. I'd, I'd say so. It, it's probably it's either the management or it could also be the publicity car too, um, because they would have publicity. Um, let me try that again. Publicity that would go out ahead of the the show, and so of course you'd have a, a car that was. Uh, elaborately decorated, really promoting the, sh the circus coming to town. But this could also be um, when the owner traveled with the show, the owner had their own private little car that was decked out like a uh, a New York apartment kind of. I mean, just really, really fancy and swank. Um, if you see the movie Water for Elephants, the owner of that show, his car, uh, when they go inside there and you kind of see how his car is laid out, that's kind of how the cars were laid out for the uh, – um, for the the owners and general managers and people that ran the show back in the heyday, um, back then, just really elaborate wood, wood and decor and just you know really decorated to the nine. And uh, lest we think that circus trains only ran in the United States, um, here's a picture of a circus train pulled up underneath the Eiffel Tower or at the Eiffel Tower station. Uh, you can see the the wooden cars off to the right. And it looks like they've already started the unloading process of the of the animals here. I'm not sure the date of this, but it's it's pretty old. <laughs> yeah, as I say, it, it looks pretty uh, pretty dated from the graininess. Oh, actually, I have a note here, 1901. This, this oh, picture. well, there we go. That is definitely dated. That's pretty old. Over a hundred years old. <laughs> this one is 1909. Um, uh, and uh, the note I made for myself on this picture, I, I'm not sure why I chose this one, but it was interesting that the circus train folks, the people who ran the circus train, got so good at it that the U.S. military came to the circus people to figure out how to run trains efficiently when they were transporting not not clowns and animals, but mm -hmm. soldiers and tanks. Well, and, and to elaborate on that a little bit more, what it really was, what was not just running the train, but it was... The, the effect that when the circus would come to town, you had a very set schedule where you'd, you'd arrive, you'd unload, set everything up, and be ready to go by showtime. And, and it's that old, you know, the postman saying, neither rain nor sleet nor snow will slow us down. It's the same thing with Ringling Brothers, too. Nothing will slow you down. You may show up 10 hours later than you were planning to, but the show will still go on. The show will always be up. And so the U.S. military actually came to study and, and learn from the circus their efficiency in getting things moved and set up and transporting from one location to the next. Um, it, they, they wanted to learn that efficiency, be able to speed up the process, which then would be able to help them in what they were doing, um, especially during the war effort, trying to get from point A to point B in the least amount of time um, and be able to get set up for whatever they needed to do. So it was definitely one of those training things that, again, you come to the circus to learn trapeze and high wire and acrobatics or to how to be timely with your military setup. <laughs> there you go. But actually, the, and the cool thing with that, that too, those wagons that were back in the back were part of the menagerie where uh, in, in the older days uh, when it was a tent show, you could actually come and you'd be able to see the animals up close in those wagons. But then during the, the um, Ballyhoo processional from the train to the actual performance grounds, um, those wagons would get pulled down the parade route. And so along with the elephants and the other animals, you would have these decorated wagons that were getting pulled and there'd be performers on them or animals in them. And, and it, again, it, it was a, it was a, true parade. I mean, it really was a parade to promote the show was in town. Um, and, and now up in Baraboo, Wisconsin, at the Circus World Museum, 
they actually have a lot of the old wagons that are still on display that you can see and they've been restored and uh, in in Madison Wisconsin or not Madison in Milwaukee Wisconsin they used to do a big circus parade and they would bring the wagons from Baraboo Wisconsin to the parade and have them in the parade and and really put on what you used to see in the old days of the circus coming to town they'd put that kind of parade on with these floats and people riding on the floats and the animals and the marching bands and and all that grand spectacle that really made it uh, what it was. And and here's some more spectacle on loading elephants. <laughs> <laughs> Those little kid, that little girl could care less. The little yeah. boy's like, hey, look, an elephant. She's like, whatever. <laughs> whatever. I've seen it before. Uh, she laces are untied. <laughs> yeah. Uh, obviously, I chose a lot of elephant photos. I'm not sure quite <laughs> how that worked out, but um, there you go. Still old boxcars, uh, wooden wooden boxcars, basically. Oh, and here we go. Here's here's the setup. Uh, uh, this photo was 1970, um, and just to give you a little history. I, for some reason, I put it on this note. About 1840s is when circuses began using the rail. 1840s. I mean, that's that's a while ago, um, mostly for limited distance uh, and some other stuff. In the 1870s is when Barnum started using piggybacks, where you put truck trailers on flat cars. Um, by the 1890s, Barnum um, and Ringling separately were moving whole circuses on rail. And um, in 1907 is when Ringling bought Barnum. Um, originally, after the purchase, you might say, they continued to operate separately, but by 1919, um, they were one circus, the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus, and that's when things started to to look like this, when the train would get to town and get the circus set up in the arena. And I think, and I think is, this, is this a preparatory kind of shot, or is this actually the show happening, Kelly? It, this looks like it's probably the show happening, and, and it's yeah, actually, because it it's 1970, is actually in the arena too because uh, like we were talking about a few minutes ago Ringling used to be in the circus tent and was in the circus tent for many many years but then um, of course many people have probably heard of the great Hartford fire which is the circus tent catching fire in Hartford Connecticut and um, the the circus tent lasted you know the era for Ringling lasted a few years longer but then they moved to the arena mainly because when you're performing in a tent, you can only perform certain months because of the weather outside. So you can only perform maybe nine months a year. But they had the great idea that if we move inside of an arena that's weather controlled and climate controlled, we can perform more. We can get more bodies in the seats. We can have more shows with more bodies, which means more revenue and more profit coming in. And so they actually moved to arenas where they could house um, – they, they, they could house more people. They could have more people in attendance. But then also, like I said, they could add on a few more months where it may be snowing outside or really bad weather, but that doesn't affect the show because the show's inside. And, uh, and then also you have the electricity and all the, all, the, uh, all the things that the arena has at your advantage. You have the bathrooms. You have the concession stands. You have the, the electricity for the, for the lights and the power and stuff. So... All that stuff made it more beneficial to move inside of an arena, and uh, and and so when they did that, there was no looking back. I mean, uh, the Gold Show did a few tent show um, days where they were they were promoting the tent, and so they actually had a tent that they were in. Um, and Feld Entertainment had a show called Clyde Escape for a while that that was actually a tent show that was in New York for a while. But um, those have just been little pop up things here and there. For the majority of the time that Ringling was around. Um, later in the years, it, it was arena shows. Um, here's a car that's being restored, actually. Uh, not exactly restored. This is an interesting process for uh, museum and modeler and restoration types. This circus car is undergoing digitization um, by the University of Southern Florida. Um, and apparently the situation, if I understood it correctly, is that the, the car is not able to be restored in the sense of operable or even viewable by lots of people. So they're digitizing it and will somehow make the car available to the masses uh, via some sort of virtual um, experience that you can quote unquote walk through the car. I thought that was kind of interesting. That's pretty cool. 
Um, here's some a uh, couple of books, and we'll have links uh, to these uh, all these things actually. If we talk about YouTube videos, or if we talk about uh, various things, there will be a lot of links on the Parlor Car Chat for this uh, session um, after I uh, get the video and get that all posted, including links to uh, find these two books if, if you're uh, intrigued. Um, I think this, Kelly, is one of those advanced cars that you mentioned earlier that yeah. went ahead of the circus train promoting. That's what it looks like. Uh, oh, yeah, because you can see it at the very far end. It says uh, the World Fair. So it was probably a circus train um, that went to the World's Fair to promote the, the circus. Oh, there you go. And, and this is still Barnum & Bailey, greatest show on earth. So the Ringling Brothers hadn't been, a, hadn't been associated, associated with it yet. Um, it was still just Barnum & Bailey's uh, show. Did, they, did, did, did that uh, notion of an advanced car con continue up until the end or close to it? So, so it, it just changed where you used to have the advanced cars and um, some of the other shows that are out there that we were talking about um, have, have advanced performers that go ahead of the show and, and promote the show coming to town. Um, Ringling was a little different where Ringling, instead of having uh, – they had the advanced cars like this for many, many years, and then they created an advanced program where they had two or three clowns that would go out ahead of the show that were former clowns that were on the road, and they would promote – um, the show coming to town, they they do news and, and shows, and then that grew from only a few clowns to the later years where they actually would hire the former clowns that were on the road that had just come off. They would hire them to be advanced clowns where you would fly out about a month before the show would come to town and you do news and radio and, and special appearances and performances um, just, just as yourself or maybe you and your partner would perform. Uh, and so when I came off the road, my um, so I was on the road for seven years, and I did advanced work for eight years. So I actually did advanced work more than I did um, time on the road, oh, and wow. that was just traveling around, going from you know every month I'd fly somewhere and I'd I'd have a few days in a city to promote, and I'd come home for a few weeks and I'd fly somewhere else, and and it really was just promoting. It was promoting the the ticket sales and promoting the sh circus coming to town and talking about the new things that the show had to offer. So the same kind of premise as the old advanced cars like this, where they were doing the same kind of thing, but then having performers that were on the road would just add that, that extra color and that extra pizzazz to the whole uh, experience. Oh, cool. Um, here's just a shot of uh, the flat cars on the circus train that would have carried the piggybacks or the carts or, or what have you. Here's hey, another shot unloading. Yeah, look. Oh, look, an elephant. Obviously, now we're getting into the more modern area. we got uh, steel cars instead of uh, yeah. wood and so on. Well, and if you look at, if you look at that, too, so that, that's, like you were saying, that, that's the new era of the stock cars. So in one of the videos that you'll actually share later on, um, they actually go into the stock cars and kind of talk about them and show them off. But you can see you have the AC units up on top. There's all these windows. There's misters built in there in, inside those cars. So uh, they ha would have AC for the animals. They'd have misters spraying cold water on them if it got a little, you know, got a little warm or whatever. And so these cars were custom-made suites for the elephants, but then also for the uh, the horses that traveled on the road as well. And then there were sometimes llamas uh, or or goats or other animals that would travel in the stocks as well. And so each car, each stock car was custom made um, for those animals and, and equipped to treat them as the divas that they were. I mean, we used to call the elephants the divas of the circus, and people would laugh and were like, no, I'm, I'm serious. They're the divas of the circus. They're taken care of better than the performers are, and we're taken care of like royalty. So just imagine how they're taken care of. It looks like uh, this is shaping up uh, to form a parade, huh? Yeah, that that is probably them unloading them uh, from the stocks and then getting them all lined up, and then they're going to get ready to go. And, and actually, you can see the the hay on their backs of the elephants. The elephants would take the hay with their trunks and just throw it in the air and throw it on their back to kind of cool themselves down. It's a it's a natural behavior that they have, and so they would come off of the the uh, stock cars and kind of do that because they knew they knew they were going to be walking for a while. So they kind of throw it on their back to help cool themselves down before they'd start walking. But it was a, it was a, it was something that the elephants did. It wasn't you know somebody getting them to do it. They did it themselves. 
And just here's at least one other kind of animal. I had to throw that in. The camel. A camel, yeah. Uh, obviously, the much older picture with the wood, back to wooden box cars. Uh, here's a picture of taking some of those uh, rolling. Uh, well, not in this case, it's not animal cages, but it's uh, equipment. Uh, trailers, I assume. Well, it, well and, and you'll see a little bit further down the, the the picture, way at the very far end. There actually are a few of the traveling um, the uh, the cat cages for for either the tigers or the uh, or the lions that might have been on the show. But yeah, these these are the wagons, the uh, the wagons that house the props, floats. There's also uh, the rigging um, for uh, you know for trapeze and all that kind of stuff. Will be all in these boxes. And then the Harlan, the guy is pulling this with a Harlan, which you see Harlans at airports, um, pull, pulling all the baggage uh, carts and stuff. And so that was the same kind of uh, vehicle that we used on the circus to be able to haul these. And they would haul them wherever the flat cars would park. They would haul these wagons from those flat cars all the way to the arena. So it could be a few miles away, and they would haul them all that way, which, again, just shows the efficiency why the military wanted to watch the – the uh, the efficiency of loading and unloading and moving a circus from one city to the other because even though there was that distance from the flats to the arena, they did it in a very time-efficient way that they were able to have everything there ready to go and set up. And the show happened at 7 o'clock on Wednesday, and by golly, it was, it was happening at 7 o'clock on Wednesday. Wow. Oh, here's your parade. Yeah. There, there, so, so there, there – and so you can see there's the uh, – there's the stock cars right there where they just unloaded all the animals, and then they walk them from the stock cars up the road uh, to the arena. And, and I'm not, I can't really tell which city this is. Sometimes I can from the background. Um, but it was probably maybe less than a mile away, so not that far. But as you can see, there's, there's all these spectators on the side watching the animals come to town. So it's not as big of a parade as it used to be with all the floats and everything. But it still was something that many people would talk about. That they would, they would, they came out as kids. Then they brought their kids out. And then they brought their grandkids out. It was just a lasting tradition that every time the circus came to town, they would come um, to watch the animal walk and and watch the elephants uh, walking down their street go into the circus. And and that headdress on the elephants, that's the one that you have in your office, right? Uh, s sort of. This is the uh, the newer. Um, this is the newer logo that they created later, um, at the later part of, uh, of the circus. The one that I have up here is probably from uh, – is one of the later ones from the 90s uh, to uh, probably early 2000s. And then uh, around mid-2000s is when they changed to the newer logo, um, when they were, they were sprucing up the show and creating new elements with – video and lighting and, and other kind of things, they they redid the logo to, to have a more modern feel. So the one that I have up here um, on the wall right there is the older is the older globe type look um, than than what you see here on their heads. But but it, it's it's the same thing though. It's a, it's the headpiece that they actually wear on their head. Um, and uh, and actually and the cool thing with the headdress too, which many people don't know because you never get up that close to it is you have the headpiece with, with the big logo, but all those little silver circles that you see are all miniature little buttons of the Greatest Show on Earth logo. Oh so the logo gosh. that you see up there on the headpiece, every one of those is the same logo but in, but in silver. Wow. Yeah, so custom-made elephant headpieces. <laughs> um, this is an interesting shot I ran into. Um, obviously a, a circus train a car... I'm not sure what with what kind, but this is this is not the crew of the circus. This is a model railroad club that got to tour a circus train uh, somewhere along the line. I'm, I'm, I don't know exactly where or when, um, but there's a what, there's a video of this um, in the links that will be on the page that you can watch their um, their tour. Look, looking at that car, that car is probably the stock car, not not the animal stock car, but. The train crew actually has a car where they have all their electrical cords and all their equipment and all the things that they need to upkeep the train year round, and so that's probably that stock car with all the uh, with all the stuff in it. Uh, I, I'd say it was a generator car, but the generator car um, doesn't have double doors on both sides. But you can see there's a door here where this gentleman's sitting, and then you see you can see the opening on the other side, which means there's a double door on the other side. Oh, yeah. And the generator car only had one door on one side, so it's probably 
it's probably the stock car where they have have all their supplies, their maintenance, the maintenance car. Um, just to keep this talk a little bit local to San Luis Obispo, here's the uh, circus arriving uh, in San Luis Obispo in the 1940s and 50s. Unfortunately, I couldn't get a picture, of, I couldn't find a picture of the train at the station, uh, but this is the walk, the, the Bally, Ballyhoo Parade, is that what you called it? Uh-huh, Bally? the Ballyhoo. Ballyhoo, um, going down um, Monterey Street. Uh, I'm not quite sure. Th and thanks to the History Center, San Luis Obispo History Center, for, for sharing these pictures with us. Um, the circus was in San Luis Obispo in, let's see, April of 48, May of 49, and May of 1950. Those are the three times that I could find, anyway, that the, the circus came to town in, in San Luis Obispo. And I think, Kelly, you said you, you saw the circus or, or one of the other circuses in town more, more uh, your 1980s? Yeah, the, the, the smaller shows that travel around that you see that, that go around, that kind of like what we were talking about, Circus Vargas and Circus Vasquez and those. Uh, Circus Vargas is, is an actual... Um, it's based in California, so so it, it's an actual California type circus. Uh, they they kind of will go east a little ways to maybe Nevada, but they don't go too far past Nevada. They, I mean, they they really stay west coast and they primarily stay in California. And so when I was a kid, um, I don't know if my parents or my grandparents were the ones that took us, but we went to the, see the circus in Pismo Beach, and uh, which is surprising. I saw a clown there, and he terrified me to death. <laughs> Yet then I became a clown. So it's just very weird. It's like, how is that possible? But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, Circus Vargas came through, and they actually still do come through. Uh, Circus Vargas plays actually at Madonna Inn in the, uh, uh, the big field right there next to Madonna Inn. They set up the circus every year, and they're there for about a week and a half, I think. So if you're driving by some point during the year and you see a circus tent up, that's probably Circus Vargas. They're doing their show at Madonna Inn. Wow. Uh, here's a shot I stumbled upon of the circus train going through the Tehachapi Loop. Um, I figured all the railroader types who would be joining us today would, would get a kick out of that. Yeah. Um, and, it was, and the fun thing, uh, kind of like what you and I had been talking about when uh, we visited earlier, was the fact that... Uh, uh, on the circus, there were two things that we always looked forward to, or actually three. Let's go with three. Uh, one of them was the time that the circus trains would pass each other. There, there was one or two times a year that we played cities that were very close to each other, so the trains would actually pass right next to each other on the, on the rails. So we would see the other train, the red or the unit, uh, blue unit train going past us. But then another one was the Tehachapi Loop, which was on the, uh, on the West Coast. And so we look forward to this because the train would actually go underneath itself. So if you were in the prime location on the circus train, you literally could be above the train as you were going over as it goes under through the tunnel. So there was that one. And then in Pennsylvania, on the East Coast, there was the Horseshoe Curve, the very famous Horseshoe Curve, where it comes into the canyon, and it, and it really it, – it's the canyon, the tracks are kind of like a horseshoe where it comes through, loops around, and then goes back out the same kind of way. And so if you're out on the vestibule watching, you would literally see the other half of the train maybe 100 yards on the other side from you going, going around. And so these were always the things that people would always run out to the vestibules or know it was coming, and they would make announcements on the radio too, on the train going, hey, we're going to be going past the Tehachapi Loop or the Horseshoe Curve in uh, in about 20 minutes, so get ready, and everybody would run out onto the vestibules and get their cameras out and get ready because it was a big it was a big thing. And here, speaking of a big thing, uh, this is as close as I ever got really to a circus train in 2011, when the circus train came through San Luis Obispo. They did not stop. They it's a long story. They were supposed to have stopped, but they were running late. <clears throat> they ended up doing all the crew change and wa animal watering and all that sort of stuff uh, down south of here somewhere. Um, I don't even remember now where, but... Um, you, you know, Jamie, actually, this, this, this picture right here actually uh, is, is a good segue into something that you might be talking about later, which is the stock cars and where they're placed in the, in the lineup of the circus train, 
where you can see the engines are right here, and the four or five stock cars are right behind the engines. It's because they're, that's less torque. Um, where when the train would take off or slow down, that's where the least amount of give and, and shakiness or jolting would happen. So they would always make sure that the stock cars where the animals were were the closest to the, uh, the engines. Because again, um, we would travel all around the United States, and so as we would move from one track to the next, it would designate who the engine was by what track it was owned by, like Santa Fe or... Uh, or, or you know th those kind of uh, rail lines, and so um, so some of the people that were the engineers of the train did freight, but they never actually did passenger cars. So they didn't realize you got to be a little softer when you're when you're attaching to the train, or when you take off, you have to be a little smoother. And they would just take off like freight trains. But imagine it's a mile long train, and so from the very beginning, it's a little bit of torque and a little bit of jolting. But as that ripple effect goes on, when you get down to the 40th car, it's now like an earthquake in California, <laughs> and things are falling off the shelves. You're rolling out of your bed, and so so that's why they would put the stock cars so close, so that so that that would never be anything the animals would have to deal with. It was the people on the other end of the train that had to deal with all those repercussions of a uh, of a freight engineer pulling the train. <laughs> wow. There's some more of the of the train coming through. This is just a couple of three shots. I forgot how many uh, of this train coming through. There's someone in the train. They, they got a kick out of waving at people. <coughs> now, there well, were a few people that, trackside that thing, watching this happen. That, that was the fun thing about riding on the circus train, too, is that you would go through areas that you know you probably would never see or ever see again, and you could just go out there on, onto the vestibule, the, the space between the or train cars, and open up the top part of the door, and pull out a lawn chair or a stool and just sit there and watch the countryside go by. Or we'd go through cities, and when you'd go through cities, there would be people waving to you and saying, hello, because, again, the side of the train says the greatest show on earth, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. There's no denying who you are. And so <laughs> people in, this, uh, in the towns would just love seeing you. And, and, yeah, you'd see people waving to you and holding up signs saying, we're so happy to see you, and, 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 and taking pictures. And, yeah, I mean, it, it was great. It, it, it was yeah. just amazing to see that. Well, like, here you go, people taking Speaking pictures. Speaking of taking pictures, yeah, there was a, quite a few people on that walkway up to the pedestrian bridge, and there were even more people on the pedestrian bridge. <laughs> and there were even more people up on the uh, station platform, which is just north of this photo. Everybody in San Luis knows where the station is related to the freight house, which you see in the picture. Uh, and that was loaded with people, too. And to, and they were hoping to see a lot more than just the thing fly by, but... Yeah, yeah they were hoping enough. for maybe a designated stop. <laughs> yeah. This was... Uh, I, it, it was just a happenstance thing. I was on the back end of a Amtrak train on a private car. We had gone down there for a railroad convention or something in San Diego, and while we were sitting there in the San Diego station, this is 2015, the circus train went by. I, I couldn't believe it. So I you know, ran out, missed half the train just because I didn't know it was coming. So, um, so Jamie, uh, this car is number 50. And that video that I sent you yesterday that my friend found of the abandoned circus train cars that are in New uh, North Carolina. Oh, yeah? One of those cars is car number 50 because oh, the guy walking past. You'll, you'll see the number, and I think the number was 55, which means that the lineup of cars, that means that car 50 was probably in that bunch. So, so <laughs> one of these cars that you see here is the same cars that the North Carolina uh, DOT purchased and then never used, and so the cars are just sitting abandoned on a, a, on, on a rail line somewhere in North Carolina. Yeah, if, uh, for, for those of you who will hunt for these links after, after they're posted, um, look for a, 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 a title that actually has the word abandoned in it. And, and that's the video that uh, Kelly is just talking about and apparently has this car in it. Amazing. Uh, and here's the only other shot I got that was worth anything. Um, as the tail end of the train, you can see by the uh, end of train marker there at the back end of that flat car. And that was it. It happened too fast to get too much. And it was at night. I wasn't ready for night either. 
Okay, so here, Kelly, we start your section of uh, stuff, and to do that, um, we threw in this picture of Kelly in Colorado Springs, yay, with Pikes Peak in the background, you can almost see it there, it's pretty pretty faint, but you can certainly see that the the circus train is in the background. So, uh, anything you want to add to this picture, Kelly, before we move on? Well, um, I, I think this picture really designates kind of how, how the circus train was in most cities. Um, th I mean, there were some cities that we were in a train yard out in the middle of nowhere, but there were many times that the circus train was on a track that was very near a park or a, uh, you know, a neighborhood or uh, like this had, there's the park here right behind me with this, with this little pond, the fountain right on the other side of the train is, uh, is the interstate. So we're right there. I mean, we're right smack dab in the middle of, of Colorado Springs. And and so that's kind of how it was when the circus train would come to town. the The train would park somewhere, and and you know, one out of one out of three times we were in a great location like this, and uh, and so it was like you know our apartment came to town, and here, <laughs> here's our little town without a zip code parked in your town for for a week, and again it, it's great promotion. You you see Ringling Brothers and Barnum Bailey Circus on the side of that train. It's it's promoting the circuses in town, and when people see that. They then look for where the circus is, or look for, you know, advertisements of where's the circus performing. I love the I love the description of a city without a zip code. That that's exactly right. It's a mile long and uh, twenty thirty whatever width of a rail car is. Um, yeah, that, that's well, well, the and, the, and, what did you call it? The beauty, silver snail. Uh, the silver snail, yeah, and, and yeah. town without a zip code because, it, I mean, the circus had over three hundred people that worked on it and. Uh, more than two thirds of those people lived on that train, so it really, truly was a town without a zip code because the amount of people that lived on there, and and each car, it wasn't exactly the same. So each car was designated a different way. Some cars had ten rooms. Some cars had ten rooms with a kitchenette at the end. Some rooms or uh, some cars had five rooms, and the rooms were bigger. Uh, or then you got to the the uh, private cars at the very end which the public cars actually had a hallway that would go from one end of the train all the way up to the other. So you could literally walk 30 cars from one end to the other and just walk from one international zone to the next. You could be in Europe, and then three cars later you're in Mexico, three cars later you're in China, three cars later you're in South America. Um, and, and so it really was an international tour. But uh, but then you get to the private cars, which were at the very far end, and the private cars were – there was no hallway because you had the full width of the, the, the train car. So you had a vestibule at either end, and then you had a vestibule in the middle, and those were the only ways to get to those rooms. And so when you had those rooms, you had the privacy of just hanging out and chilling out in your room on the train runs, which – was good, but also bad. I mean, if you wanted to hang out with other people, you couldn't be able, you wouldn't be able to do that. But for me, I got one of the private cars when I became boss clown on the circus for my last three years, and by that point, I was happy to have my isolation for three days. I was like, I want to be in my private room all by myself and reading and drawing and watching movies and stuff. There you go. That now that actually is not my private car. That actually 189 was the uh, was the clown car for the circus on the blue unit, which you can actually designate the globe on the side of the train car is blue. For the red unit, it was actually red. So that's how you could always tell which train was going through the town or there, as you'd see the globe, and the globe would tell you what color it was. But uh, 189 was the clown car, which is where most of the clowns lived. And we had, we had 12 rooms in there, uh, a, uh, two bathrooms, there was a shower unit, there was a washer dryer, and it, at the far end, we actually had a kitchenette, which had an oven and cabinets and all that. And then the rooms themselves actually had, um, they had refrigerators. So you would just, you'd store your refrigerated stuff in there, but then you'd store all your cabinet stuff, your, uh, your, your non-perishable foods and your plates and all the cookware and stuff in the kitchen and your cabinets that you had. And then people coming to visit the, the circus. This is, uh, this is uh, Mark Brady, who uh, Mark in, and his wife Diana were uh, – uh, Diana was our assistant pastor at the First United Methodist Church in, uh, in Royal Grandy when I was still living there before I joined the puppet tour, and, uh, but as, as ministers. So she was on the Pacific Coast, and then Mark was actually uh, 
uh, a minister on the East Coast. So they would flip-flop back and forth where she would get appointed somewhere and be there for a while. Then they would go back to the East Coast, and he would be somewhere for a while. So it was just a back and forth. So they had moved to Maine, and they were in Maine. Um, so this is them. Um, after I joined the show, they, they came to visit the show. Actually, no, it wasn't Maine. It was, um, it was Connecticut. Um, they came to visit. But, uh, yeah, so I, I would have people that I knew when I would be on the road would come and visit the circus train, and so I'd show them around and take them around and give them a tour. Uh, many people from... Uh, from my church days, uh, from the puppet troop and, and the youth ministry, um, when I'd come through California, would come visit, and then family would come visit, and then family friends that we knew. Um, so yeah, so it was always it was always a fun thing to show the uh, the home away from home. That's kind of a lousy picture of uh, the people <laughs> <you would attract. laughs> There's a great water tower. That's fun though. But look at that. Get the give the elephants a bath. That's that's what they love. They love and, and they they really do. It, it's funny when it's bath time and they they pull out the hoses and spray them down. They love it. They get out there. They soak up the water and spray it in the air. They trumpet and just uh, they they have the they have the most fun. And it's it's so funny to watch the elephants, uh, you know, get their get their baths. <laughs> and there's the uh, obviously the red group, right? The red unit. Uh huh. You got it, because of the logo, the logo color. I'm catching on, I'm catching on. But, and, and this is another animal walk that you see right there with all the elephants lined up moving around. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. And this, I think, is a setup, getting ready for a show, right? Yeah, so, so this is, we were talking about, um, when I was talking about Steve Smith earlier, and I was talking about winter quarters, this is actually Tampa, the fairgrounds in Tampa, um, where we would actually, for many, many years, would do our winter quarters, which winter quarters, if you ever saw the movie The Greatest Show on Earth, where uh, when the movie first starts and Charlton Heston comes in and they're getting everything ready and putting things onto the train and getting ready to head out, uh, that was their winter quarters in Sarasota. Well, in Tampa, we would be here at the fairgrounds, and um, this is where we would come in and we would, we would work on and rehearse the new show that was going to go out for a two-year tour. So we had just finished a two-year tour, came back and spent the month of December um, working on this new show that the, that the production team had been working on all year round, getting it ready. So we were learning the new choreography, learning the new bits, learning the flow of the show. The new props were built and brought out, and then our costumes were made. So we'd start wearing our costumes. And so this is, this is the practice, which is why you see these performers – are, are just wearing street clothes. They're not wearing any costumes because their costumes are still being made. So this is them just uh, rehearsing all their choreography for one of the parts of the show. And then, um, and this is probably pretty far on looking at props and, and stuff that are in the shot. So this probably was the third week. And so this is going into the final week of rehearsals before the show opened in Tampa uh, the first week of January. And then uh, Gene Pettis. Yeah, oh, yeah. speaking uh, uh, the well, I'll let you talk about it. But the the fact that there's a train master on this train, and this is him, Gene. What's his last name? Gene Pettis. Gene Pettis. Uh, he's responsible for the train. Um, and I'll let you take it from there, Kelly. If you uh, yeah. want to add. Yeah. Well, actually, before I talk about Gene, so that image earlier that had the model train people in it, and you weren't sure who exactly oh, yeah. they were. So that car, this is the interior that I was kind of talking about where there's – you see all like the ladders and the extension cords and all that stuff there. Um, th this is what the interior of that car that they were all standing outside of. That's what it looks like inside. Um, but yeah, Gene Pettis. So the circus train actually had a train master, and the train master was the one who essentially was in charge of the train. Um, you had the general manager who was in charge of the circus, and – the the entirety of the circus. So they were in charge of everything that was circus. Um, but then you had a production manager who was in charge of the the production aspect of the show. And then you had an operation manager who was in charge of the operation portion, you know, dealing with the building and, and all the union people and things that, that might go into us coming into an arena. But then you had the train master who was in charge of the circus train. And they had porters who were the people that worked for them that, that did all the maintenance work and everything on the train. But uh, Gene Pettis actually came with a, with a train background. He actually was a train engineer uh, for many, many years. And so when he retired, he came to the circus and, and joined the circus. And his daughter was actually the head electrician, and that's actually why he got brought on 
is they knew they needed a train master. And so she was like, hey, my dad just retired from the rails, and maybe he'll come out. So he and, he and his wife came out, and uh, he was train master for all my years that I was on the blue unit before I moved to the red unit. But his, his vast knowledge of, of trains really helped out because he knew the inner workings of a train and, and moving a train from one city to the next. And if there was a problem, he knew how to fix it, and he knew um, how to fix it quickly. Because again, if you have 300 plus people living on the circus train and AC goes out or water heaters go out or something happens, your doniker is not working, you got to get that fixed quick. Um, and so having that having that knowledge really helped out. So Gene, Gene was a very valuable asset to the circus um, as every train master was because they were the ones who kept our home, our home and, and kept it working perfectly. So – your town, um, really. So yeah, so so really a, a big job, but uh, I mean, we were very thankful to have them there. It's me. Look at me. Look at me. Ah, uh, that's what is that? <laughs> that's ten years ago, maybe more than that. I don't know. Yeah, that it's actually uh, from pre-show, which uh, on the circus, many many people might not know this if you've never been to the circus before. But uh, the circus, you have the main show, but then you would have. Uh, in the older days, uh, it used to be called it used to be called come in, where the audience would come in and sit down in the stands, but then the clowns would come out and perform little clown gags on the track around around the arena floor in front of certain sections of the of the uh, audience. But then they created um, in the late 90s they created something called the adventure, which was the hour before the show began, where they actually opened the arena floor to the audience. So if you came an hour early, you could come down to the arena floor and meet the performers, try on costumes, watch circus acts, and and see things up close, and then also get autographs and take pictures, which it was great. But this right here really emphasizes one of the things that we I don't want to I don't I, hate is such a bad word, and I don't like using the word hate, but we really strongly disliked this part, which was people would come up and want autographs. But we had things that we had to do. We had gags or, or performances that we had to do for the pre-show. But we would have people coming up left and right wanting autographs, and we're like, okay, I, I'll give you an autograph once I'm done, but i got to go into the ring right now. No, you have to sign my book. No, 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 no. <laughs> I will, but i got to go in there. I paid, I'm paying your salary because I bought a ticket price, so you got to sign my book. And it was that kind of stuff where, where you, would learn, you would learn how to snake around that to get to the arena uh, ring to be able to perform and do your stuff, you know, and, and so it was tricky, but um, <laughs> as seasoned professionals, we learned how to do it, but yeah, the autographs were great, but it got to the point that it was like, people just wanted the autograph, they didn't want to see up close what was going on, they'd just rather have an autograph and then go find somebody else to sign their book, so it, it was those tricky ways to pull them to your performance space to watch you work, it, it, it's the trick or treat, you know, okay, you watch my trick, and then I'll give you the treat of the autograph afterwards. There's a little Halloween tie, and you see how that worked. Speaking of seasoned professional, <laughs> not my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Tell so, us about what's going on here. So uh, the gentleman, first of all, with the newspaper wrapped around his head, is Lane Vernardos. Uh, Lane Vernardos was the uh, dad of Kevin Vernardos, who was the ringmaster of Ringling for many years, and who are who now I have to say already, but now has his own traveling show called the Bernardo Circus. Amazing, amazing one ring show where he started doing shows just in fairgrounds and little pop up areas, and now has has his own circus tent. He goes around and sets it up just like any other circus, but it, it's the circus of dreams, and uh, and it really it really stems from Kevin joining Ringling Brothers as a Broadway performer. He had just he had just graduated from Ithaca College and was wanting to be a Broadway performer and then got on the circus and then got bit, uh, bit by the circus bug. But his dad was a producer for CBS, so produced Survivor and other, other shows like that. And Lane loved circus trains, and he loved trains in general. Um, he loved model trains. He loved real trains. So when Kevin joined the show and he knew that Kevin was – on the Silver Snail, he's like, I'm coming out to visit. I'm going to come out and travel with you occasionally, and I, I, I want to I wanna travel on the train. So he did, and he created he, – he actually created a few video series called uh, The Circus Train Adventures that 
he would make these videos and then give them out to all the performers. And then uh, I think they're now on YouTube, which you actually might have one of those that you'll link later on. Um, but it, it, he would film with his camera and then go back home and edit on his uh, editing um, his editing setup and then make these great videos. But he would capture not only the travel on the rail, but he would capture the life of the circus. You know the the behind the scenes aspects and and you know here's the spectacle of on the arena floor, but here's other aspects of what goes on backstage and and life on the circus. And one of those things was. On your birthday, it was a tradition that goes back many, many years that you would get pied, the the circus pieing, and you know it could be a pie shell with with, with uh, a pie inside of it, or it could be various other things. Now on the circus, you don't use a real pie because a real pie is too thick and too hard. You use shaving cream because shaving cream actually the consistency of a shaving cream holds up and and won't like if you use whipped cream whipped cream because of the dairy base will melt um in a matter of minutes but with shaving cream it won't melt it'll 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 just hold its form and so we would take plates or we take pie shells or in this case we take newspapers and put the shaving cream inside of it and it was the element of a sneak attack and uh when i first joined the circus john weiss who was the human uh, clown and ball at the time on the circus. He, he was a clown and a cannonball all at once. Um, he was a he was a longtime clown on Ringling with the Clown College. He was the birthday pie clown. But then when he left, he said to me, "I'm going to train you, and you're going to become the pie clown." And so I stepped in and learned all of his tricks. And so I I then started pieing people for the remainder of my years on the Blue Show before I went to the Red. And this is one of the ways you could do it where you take the shaving cream and put it inside of a newspaper and then close it up. Now, it's in the very center of the paper, but nobody knows there's, there's shaving cream in there. So you can come out reading the newspaper or talking about it. So here I was telling Lane that there was an article about Kevin in the newspaper, and it was a great article. And I was like, did you see it? He's like, no, I didn't see it. I'm like, how, how did you not see it? It's like, oh, okay, well, let me find it. So I'm flipping to find the shaving cream. He's, he doesn't know it's coming because he doesn't know there's anything inside there. And when I got to the middle page, I just flipped the paper and put it right in his face, and then he got, he got birthday pied. And so it was Kevin who set him up because it was his birthday, and Kevin wanted his dad pied by the circus pieing clown, and so that's what we did. They got it all on video and everything. And so, again, it just, it, it's a tradition. There's many traditions on the circus, and that's just one of them. That uh, that really carried on all the way through the very end. Um, when I left, somebody else took it over, and then somebody took it over from them, and it just kept going. Where the clowns were, the birthday pieing clowns, and if it was your birthday, you would hide, or you would do whatever you could not to get pied. But rest assured, before the end of the night, you would get pied. <laughs> uh, speaking of pies, uh, tell us about the pie car. So the pie car actually, uh, which is it's pretty cool. If you look at it, the picture you see in the in the black and white image is pretty much the same that 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 it was uh, in later years too. That same kind of setup where it was boots, kind of like a diner. But what the pie car was is, is it was a dining car on the circus train, and it was right in the very middle of the public cars. So uh, there were you know there were. 14 cars on one side and 15 cars on the other side and then the pie car right in the middle. And on train runs, it was open 24 hours a day. Uh, so you could come there at any point during, during the train run and get food if you wanted to. There was always a cook in the kitchen. But then when the train would actually get spotted and, and uh, placed in town, then there were actually hours to the pie car just like any restaurant. But – it was a place to gather. As you can see behind Oscar, Oscar's the clown here. Behind Oscar, there's all these people. It was a place to gather and, and get together and socialize. On train runs, people come down there and play cards or play games, board games. Uh, they just come down there just to socialize and visit, to get out of their rooms. But it's kind of like a parlor car that you would see on, on other trains where you would go and watch the countryside go by. This was the gathering place to get together and, and uh, hang out and watch countryside go by and visit with your friends and, and get a great meal. And, and most of the chefs um, that were hired by Ringling Brothers were gourmet chefs. Um, the guy that was on when I was on the Blue Show, his mom was a five-star gourmet chef in uh, New Orleans. So she, she worked at these big, big resorts and fancy restaurants, and so he learned from her. So when 
uh, Mike Vaughn was cooking in the kitchen and you knew he was cooking that day, you would come in because you knew it was going to be some gigantic gourmet meal because he's just like – he was just – in you know, I'm going to have a little uh, – I'm going to experiment and see what I can come up with. And you knew whatever his experimenting was going to do, it was going to be amazing. So – uh, this we talked about, or you talked about a little bit, Kelly, earlier about the fact that all these train cars, particularly the stock cars and uh, specialty use ones, were custom made. Um, and here's just a, a picture of uh, a couple pictures of of re repurposing uh, existing rail cars into circus cars. Um, and I read somewhere, uh, as this upper right hand photo says. It took about 9,000 man hours to completely recycle one train car into a circus train car. And then up in the upper right hand corner, you can see three guys ripping up the floor, um, the demo stage, I guess you'd say, of transforming an old rail car uh, or a different rail car into a circus car. Well, they, they used to actually call it gutting, which is like, well, that's I, about I, right. I guess the people that used to do it used to fish as well. I don't know, but. Um, yeah, what they would do is they, they would actually get these rail cars from Amtrak or other uh, other Pullman cars, and they would get in there, and they would completely gut the car, so they, they would hollow it out and then come back in and then build the rooms, the schematics to whatever they were needing. Um, and then once the new car was uh, essentially recycled and remodeled, it would then go out on the road, and they would take the car that it was replacing and then bring it back. And this is all done in, in Florida at the uh, – at the uh, Feld Entertainment headquarters, they actually had a department for the, the train um, uh, restorations. And so they would bring the train cars there, do all the work, and then, like I said, just cycle them through where one new car would go out and then, then one or two cars would come off the road and either get fixed up or remodeled or whatever. But, uh, but yeah, they would get gutted completely and then, then put back together. And it, I think in one of the videos that you're going to share, uh, that you're going to link to, I think there, there's a section on that where you can kind of see them and they'll talk about the yeah. remodeling and fixing of that. Yeah. And here's just uh, insides of uh, one of the stock cars. Yeah. This, so here, here's, the, here's the alpacas that are, that are traveling on the road, and this is just one of their many pens inside the stock car. So they can move from here to the next pen and stuff and, uh, and, and just move around freely in there. And again, it's right behind the engine, so there's really no jostling or anything for them. So it's a nice, smooth ride. And as you can see, plenty of alfalfa pellets and hay for them to uh, eat and, and uh, nosh on. And there's always there, there were always handlers back there with them, 24/7 um, during train runs that were uh, that were cleaning the pens and feeding them and making sure everything was great and fine. And there was actually a, a vet on the circus as well. Uh, a fully uh, a fully trained vet that would actually come out on the road and, and live full time on the road. And so there was always a vet there um, in case any of the animals uh, had issues, got sick or whatever. There there was always that vet to help out. And, and how about the sleeper? So so this is again like we were talking about the the different sized rooms. This room right here is actually part of the um, the private cars, and so it, it's it's a much bigger room. And, uh, and and here you can see there there's a couch, but then you can look right out the windows and you see countryside going by. Above his head, there's cabinets up there for storage. Off to the side, there's there's little shelves and the refrigerator's probably over there. But um, but it, it's a private it's a private car, so from one side of the train to the other. So that means they have windows here. They turn around. There's windows on the other side uh, of their room as well. Where in the public cars that have the hallway going through the hall or go, going through the train. You had windows only on one side because the other side was the wall because the, the hallway was there. And then this is – so the picture on the left-hand side is my private room, um, which, which was a uh, – it was a quarter car um, of, of, the, of the private cars. Um, and so I had a full-size fridge, a full-size oven, had my own sink. I had my own washer-dryer unit. It was a full-size closet. I had my – a, a queen size bed in the room. I had my own bathroom with the shower and, and toilet and all that. So, um, so it was much much bigger. And then the picture with the corgi is actually a picture of the uh, of the production manager's room. Production manager was a friend of mine, and so that's his room um, that he had with his wife. And it's just it's a different kind of kitchen setup where the uh, the fridge is where it is, and then the oven is on right in front of the fridge. Then off to the side of the fridge, underneath the paper towels, is the uh, is the sink, 
And so just a little bit different, same sized room, just a little bit different setup. Um, but again, both these rooms are, are the privates, so we had the full width of the, the train car. And Hershey, Pennsylvania, look at that. One of the best smelling train yards ever. <laughs> <laughs> I just <laughs> happened to have a Hershey chocolate. bar here. It, it, it was great. The, the funny thing, so when you're in Hershey, you knew when they were making all the cocoa stuff because you could smell the smell of chocolate in the air. When you were in Boston, we parked at MIT. Um, the uh, MIT campus had, had a, a, train, uh, a train line, and that's where the circus train would park. It parked right next to the Necco wafer factory of Necco <laughs> wafer fame. And so when we were parked there, you could smell what they were making, and you could smell the flavor. So you knew what flavor of Necco wafers they were making that day because they would only make one batch of, like, the chocolate or the grape or the peppermint. But you could literally smell the smell out of that Necco wafer factory uh, of what the wafers were. So here, yeah, here in Hershey, um, you could smell the smell of chocolate in the air. And all the street lights. I don't, I don't no, you can't really see any street lights, but the street lights in Hershey are all Hershey Kisses. <laughs> I think there, I think actually there is one right there. Yeah. So if you got close enough, you'd see it's a, it's a Hershey <laughs> Kiss. It's the funniest thing, but yeah. And then for the rail fans in the group, you might notice that blue bo uh, caboose is a Conrail car, um, which uh, I won't go into all about what made up Conrail, but there, there is one. Kids in the classroom. Kids in the classroom, because you got families on the road, and uh, that that's one thing. Actually, the uh, if people watch the video with the abandoned uh, train car, uh, the gentleman who who's doing the little you know walk through of the train actually mentions the families, and he and he sees one of the bigger rooms, and he goes, yeah, there's there there's a bigger room here. You know, that's because I heard there's families on the circus, and and that's true. Um, on, on the circus, again, you have that many people. There's going to be families. There's going to be husbands and wives with their with their kids, and there's generational families. The performers are generational, so there's you know fifth or sixth generation. So grandma and mom and dad and the kids are all performers in the circus, and so you're traveling 11 months out of the year with the circus, but there's still an education that's still there. And so the kids, the the circus kids actually had school and, and there were trained teachers that, that came and lived on the circus and that was their job to be to be the teachers on the circus. And they they would teach um from first grade all the way up to twelfth grade. And they, they would teach all that curriculum very much based off the homeschool curriculum that, that's out there. But they would they would teach these kids and the kids would come and have their school time and kids would graduate. Um there were many kids that during my seven years uh, they they went through 12th grade and then they graduated and then they went off and and you know went off to college or, or they stayed on the road and became performers as well but uh, but many of them would get that education that 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 graduation and then move off and um, and go off and do uh, do college and and then move off into another career that wasn't circus or maybe come back as management and do the business side of things but uh, but it was amazing and there was also a nursery too where if you had a family that had a newborn or a very young child who couldn't go to school. There was a nursery, and, and so as mom and dad were out performing the trapeze, the, the kids were in the nursery hanging out with their friends, and then after mom and dad were done with their act, they'd come back and get the kid, take, the, take their child back to their dressing room for a while, or just leave their child in the nursery and, and let them play in there for the, the show because they knew they had to go back out to do a few more things in the show later on. So um, tru truly, I mean, it, it's it's... It was family entertainment, but it was also it, it was also family too. It was definitely um, that family feel where you had you I mean you had youngsters and you had grandparents and you had everybody just running around and and when there were birthdays we celebrated birthdays like this one right here. Um, nice. and, and when, when Halloween, we're on Halloween today. On Halloween, again, we would dress up in our outfits to perform the show. So on Halloween, we'd have a show. We're in costumes. So it was always the big thing on Halloween that once the show is over, we would get one of the uh, one of the party rooms at the arena, and we would have a Halloween party, and all the performers could get dressed up in their own Halloween costume, and we'd have a little circus Halloween party because it was a chance to get into our costumes after the show was over. And I think every year that I was on the show, 
Maybe there was one year that didn't happen, but every year that I was on the show, somebody in the show wanted to be me, and they would come to me and go, can you put your clown face on me? Can I wear your outfit? And so every year, I was in the clown parties. Not me, because I was dressed as something else, but there was somebody dressed up like me in clown at these parties every year, because somebody wanted to be me. And it, Yeah, it was funny, but it's like, all right. But then... Look at this picture, though. So these kids, like there's some of them, like like uh, Vaughn, who has the green plaid in with the red hair on top. Um, he uh, he was a little kid when I first joined, and I saw him grow up. Um, he was like a little brother to me. I saw him grow up, and then um, he went off and was a solo clown on the Gold Show for a while. Then he came back, and and now he actually works in a pirate stunt show in Pigeon Forge, and. Uh, and doesn't work circus anymore, but still utilizes all the routines and the skills that he had um, as a performer. And then, and then uh, some of the other girls that are over here on the side have now grown up, and they went off to college. And and so again, they were raised on the circus and did the circus, but then they graduated. And when they graduated, then they went off and and got a, a college education, and and now are doing other things. And uh, it, it's just one of those, you know, it, it's it's life. Circus is life, but it's also um, it prepares you for the real world, so when you're ready to step out and do your other stuff, you can. There's Snake River right there. I, well, actually, I know where the trees are. Snake River, and I think, I think the other one is too. It's it's northern Northern California going into Oregon, and just this is a great example of uh, of truly the landscapes that the circus train would go through. There's no roads where this is going. This it's this train track, the mountain on one side, and a river on the other, and nothing else. And so you go through areas that nobody has, has ever seen unless they were on the train. And we'd go through New Mexico or Utah areas where it was just train tracks and then open nothingness. And it was just so cool. Like New Mexico was like you were going through an Old West movie, the plateaus and the, uh, the run-on, you know, just deserts that went on for miles and miles and miles. And, you know, it was just you, the train, and this open nature that God made that was just phenomenal to see and then you get here where you're going right through the booming metropolis of san diego beaches <laughs> which yeah. again th th and this was as you all know with california uh the amtrak line goes right along the coast um you know from san diego up into santa barbara up into santa um uh santa maria san luis obispo area before you get to san luis and then it cuts inland um but uh, this is how the train would go from from L.A. down to San Diego. It would take that track right along the California coast. So you'd go past beaches and and all those uh, uh, all those many people out there, you know, enjoying the uh, the sunny weather, surfing, and then they look and there's a circus. Train.